Can you hear me okay? Is this microphone better than the video? I hope so. Good morning, everybody. Um, as you know, commitments are at the center of CGI and what it stands for. Uh, we have some very, very exciting uh, commitments to action this morning from our pitch makers down here to my left. Pitch makers, you just stand up for one quick second. Here they are. Will you welcome them, please? I am Rex North, an executive director of the Clean Tech Open, as you've heard. Uh, we have a brand new session here for the first time at uh, CGI's annual meeting. It's called Scalable Ideas Pitching for Partnerships. Uh, as you're no doubt aware, you've heard this morning the theme of this year's annual meeting is mobilizing for impact. It's our responsibility as a group to use this platform, the CGI platform, to mobilize new partners to take these commitments to scale and to maximize their impact. You're going to hear five pitches this morning about five CGI commitments to address important global challenges. These cover a range of the different CGI tracks. Um, and before we get started, let me explain how this whole thing came about because these guys have been through quite a process already. Uh, more than 30 CGI commitment makers submitted a sample pitch video and application. A selection committee of senior CGI leadership and external advisors evaluated their application against a standard set of criteria. They included proof of concept. Do you remember this, guys? Proof of concept, potential for scale and impact, and breadth of partnership um, opportunities. They also had to be judged against the potential for innovativeness of approach. So. It was a tough, tough choice, and there were many inspiring and impactful initiatives, but we are thrilled to have 10 of these original 30 now pitching. There are five on this morning, and a, uh, another session on Thursday morning at 10.30. Please join us. The same thing applies uh, on Thursday. Five more pitches. So to help mobilize these pitch makers on uh, my left over here, we also have a team of expert panelists so you can see them in the dark over there. Can we get some light on the panelists? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Perfectly done. Thank you, Linda. You can see Linda's already the showgirl here. So well done, Linda. OK, so um, this morning's expert panel consists of James Moangi, who is global managing partner for Dalberg Global Development Advisors, Linda Rottenberg in the red over there. Thank you, Linda, uh, CEO of Indo Endeavor Global, and Chuck Slaughter, who is the founder and president of Living Goods. Please welcome our panel. <laughs> so here's the deal. There is part of this where you guys play a key role, which means that after we've finished the pitches and after we've had some questions from the panel, some clarifying questions, we will ask you to repair to the back of the room. There will be some tables, and we're going to ask you to work with these people. Remember, this is about mobilizing for impact. It's your responsibility and yours and yours to help these guys to form the kinds of partnerships they need for scale, okay? That's the format of this whole process. Okie dokes. Um, so on to the uh, first of the presentations. Without further ado, I'm going to invite Olivier Berra, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Man and Nature, to come up on stage here right now. Olivier, welcome. Thank you. Um, we were... 3 billion people on the planet only in the 1930s. We reached 7 billion last year, and we're likely to be more than 10 billion by the end of the century. This leads to countless animal species being exterminated in the name of progress, but also millions of plants. That's what I want to talk about. These plants, please realize that when plants are disappearing, 60% of the drugs that have been put on the market to treat cancer during the last 40 years approved by USDA have orini originated from plants. This is a tragedy for humankind when we lose these plants because this is what we need to save, you know, lives around the world. What we do with man and nature, we fight poverty. Because just to give you an example, in Madagascar, the Malagasy rosier periwinkle is treating cancer and to these plants is saving 60,000 lives in United States and Europe every year. The women collecting the roots of these plants for the industry are making less than $1.50 a day. This doesn't make any sense to me. What we do with Man and Nature, we get involved on the field to fight poverty because this is how we're going to achieve the biodiversity conservation. 
And for example, in Peru, um, people were chopping down wild palm trees to sell the fruits on the nearby market. But with the increase of the population to the nearby city, it was not sustainable. That was bad for biodiversity to chop down these trees. But it was also, it was also bad for the sustainability of their incomes and bad for climate change. What we did, we supported the local NGOs to help these local communities, and we provide them a mill to extract the oil of the seeds of these trees. But also we provided the expertise of a company specialized in oils. And now these local communities are, are doing oils, and they're exporting these oils at the best international quality standard, and they're not chopping down the trees anymore. In Nepal, we supported local communities to produce essential oil, and this is now reducing conflicts they had with the elephants and the rhinoceros coming in their field in the nearby forest of the Bardia National Park. In Burkina Faso, we support women, you know, doing the Shia butter production, but by the side of the forest, so we can involve them into the conservation of the plants and of the animals. When we looked at the scaling up potential, we have looked just in Africa this year, there's been 70 potential projects that we, if, if, what we have identified. So we need to have more involvement of private companies, of, of also individuals to get involved into following these small scale projects that we are doing on the field and that these people are doing. But I tell you, it's exciting. That's what we want to have. People to follow directly a small scale project because they are the ones who are efficient and they are the ones who are going to do the work of protecting you know, the biodiversity, which is the world heritage we need absolutely to keep. Man and nature is just a tool. What we want to do is to make links. We want to help private companies to get involved. And last year, our challenge was to involve private companies in small-scale projects. And we have been able to involve 10 private companies into different field projects. And I tell you, this is exciting, because it's exciting to follow directly a field project. So what we want to do with Man and Nature is bring the companies using the natural ingredients to do better sourcing of their active ingredients. We want to have more sustainability, and we also want to have more ethic into the sourcing of the natural ingredients. And we also want to support more these local NGOs because they are the ones who are going to make the difference. So we want to find partners to help them financially to do the work on the field so we can preserve the world natural heritage, which is biodiversity, and protect the environment while at the same time fighting poverty. Thank you very much. Okay, our second speaker is Pallavi Gaikwad. She is the program officer of Sport for Development, uh, the NAS Foundation India Trust. Up you go, Pallavi. Actually, Pallavi is getting undressed for us. Uh, yeah, so. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Pallavi Gaikwad. I'm an athlete. I can't say that because I play netball. But the net athlete in me does not live only on netball court. She reveals herself when I walk down the street in Mumbai, ready to meet the eyes of others without fear. You can see that the athlete in me when I talk to younger girls with full of energy and enthusiasm. Yes, I'm a young girl from India, like those in reports and media coverage you read. But I'm not powerless. I'm not exploited. I'm not anemic. I am a young girl. I am a change agent. I am a leader, and I'm because of sport. <laughs> Through Gold, a girls' empowerment program, supported and created by Standard Chartered Bank and implemented by St NAS Foundation, which pairs netball with life skill session. I got to play the sport I love. How to pivot was important. How to change direction in life is the lesson that will last beyond my days on court. Sport is an effective strategy to empower girls. It gives them the opportunity to not just talk about challenging gender roles, using their voice, owning their body, but actually practice it and leave it. Picture this. Vaishnavi Yadav is a 19-year-old girl. When she joined the program, she was 17. Her mother is housewife and father is auto rickshaw driver. She joined the program and she started coming regularly on the pro program. And she taking participate and leadership in activities. 
After one year program on the program, she become a community sports coach on the program. When we ask her ki what she think about goal, she said, goal program is very important for girls to understand their life, their freedom, and their rights. Yes, I go she said, I learned lots of new things on the program. I learned about my body. I learned, I clear cleared all myths about HIV and AIDS. Yes, uh, now I enjoy my life with my rights. Actually, when I joined the program, I didn't understand the meaning of empowerment. But now I proudly say I am an empowered girl in my community, and that is because of sport. Today, there are 600 million adults and girls are growing up in developing countries like mine. Some benefits from the program you all support, but many do not. They need to get out of social isolation. They need to Im improve their physical health. They need goal program. Women Win is an international organization that is a building a movement using sport as a tool to empower girls and address their rights. Their work enabled me to participate in goal program and become a coach and stand up tall on this stage today. We made a commitment to get 100,000 girls in active in quality sport program. We are just about to meet it. Through partnership with Standard Chartered Bank and implementing organization like NAS, this movement is growing. Now we want to raise the stakes and involve more girls. Involve more girls. Uh, now, raise your hands if you have played sport. <laughs> wow. Raise your other hand if you have seen the benefits in your life wow amazing so you understand now imagine if you could bring that transformative power to lives of the girls you serve could it deepen your work could it accelerate the outcome you seek would it be good for girls be looking for be looking for partners to making this effort would you like to join the game Thank you. Thank you very much, Palavi. Great job. Uh, third up, we have Farah Mohammed, who is creator, president, and chief empowerment officer for the Girls 20 Summit. Hello, everyone. So I fall a lot, so I'm going to stay at the podium. <laughs> um, I'd, like to, I'd like all of you to think of the G20 leaders, Obama, Putin, Merkel, Harper. Now substitute a girl in each of those G20 spots. A girl from each G20 country and one from the African Union. They're all between the ages of 18 and 20. Give her her name, maybe it's Tanvi, Kartika, Julia, Alina. Picture her in a room with 20 other girls who have traveled thousands of miles. They're not there because they're poor or rich. They're not there because they're at the top of their class. They are there because each of them has the potential to lead in their own country. Now invest in these girls by giving them tangible, multi-sectoral skills, business planning and debt management, communications and technology, and do this with your private sector partners. Let them go to sleep for a few hours, then wake them up and give them the same agenda the G20 leaders deal with. How to build, sustain our economies with sound economic and social policies. Enter leaders from technology companies, farmers from Kenya, scientists from Indonesia, social profit and for-profit entrepreneurs from right here in America. Cultivate a dialogue between these industry leaders and girls, a dialogue filled with cre creativity and commitment to maximize the potential of the 3.5 billion girls and women in the world. Dine them, don't wine them, and let them sleep again. Then wake them up and put them in a room and ask them to stay there until they unanimously agree on the actions and the ideas they want to recommend to G20 leaders. Ideas like making it necessary to include a free Wi-Fi in every new building built with government dollars, or incentivize access to capital for female entrepreneurs. Then accept a meeting with the G20 leader Sherpa to go through the Girls 20 recommendations to ensure that, there are, uh, that the other G20 hears their voices. Give the girls a chance to experience the Kremlin, the Eiffel Tower, or have an empanada in Mexico, or a beaver tail in Canada, a personal favorite, because now their work really begins. 
They return home, they are matched with a global panel of advisors, and they find a way to make an impact in their own backyard. Some start their own social profit initiative, others scale up the work of others. This map, and if you could flip to the map please, this map shows the areas where Girls 20 Summit delegates have started their own initiatives in four short years. Let me illustrate what I mean. This is a picture of Kartika, next slide please, who came to the first Girls 20 Summit which was held in Toronto. Kartika came to us from Indonesia. Post-summit, Kartika went back home with her new skills. She got a bus donated, she recruited her friends, she ripped out the seats, she got books donated. She took that bus and friends into the slums of Indonesia and now she reads to boys and girls. That's what I call a mobilizing impact. She and her team believe that literacy is a game changer. Kartika and 80 other, 83 other girls have been mobilized for impact, and they have in turn mobilized others in their communities for impact. As we approach our fifth summit, we are now at a crucial point. We need $1 million a year to keep this going, and we need each and every one of you to think about the girls that we need to find. Think about the girls that crossed your path and send her to the Girls 20 table. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Farah, very much. Great job. Um, next up, we have Salif Romano Niang, who is the Chief Impact Officer of Malo. Just because you fill your kid's belly with rice every day doesn't mean they're still not hungry. Children in Mali, my native country, start to eat rice as soon as they can chew. But due to the lack of nutrients in milled or white rice, this often leads to health problems. Every 10 minutes, a child in Mali dies from a disease preventable by better nutrition. 67% of women suffer from iron deficiency anemia, a major reason why so many die while trying to give life. Farmers work their, work their butts off, but can't forge ahead or lift themselves out of poverty due to lack of equipment and proper crossing facilities. They also have to deal with unscrupulous middlemen and traders. We at Malo believe we can change that. We believe rice has the power to boost the living standards of farmers and at the same time deliver essential vitamins and minerals to women and children. The health impact of enriching rice with vitamin A, iron, zinc, folic acid is well established scientifically. Based on our own calculations, it costs just 75 cents to fortify 100 kilograms of rice enough to feed a mother and her child for an entire year. So in 2012, we made a CGI commitment to produce locally grown fortified rice, 2,500 tons of locally grown forti fortified rice by 2015. By the end of this year, our first dedicated processing and fortification center that can fortify up to 5,000 tons, enough to feed 50,000 people per year, will be up and running. For us to make hungry farmers an oxymoron, to make Fortified rice, the industry standard, we need your help. Our model has three key components. The first is to increase the incomes of farmers, and we do this by paying them a 15% premium at harvest for their harvest. The second is to create, build, and operate modern and efficient facilities that transforms the rice grown by farmers into healthy rice. The third is to create branded rice-based products that are top quality, yet affordable. So in order for us to achieve our goals, we've already partnered with a 30,000 member farmer cooperative to provide us with our raw material, which is unprocessed rice. We're working with Path and Gain, two world-renowned international health organizations, to provide us with food, uh, te technical expertise around food fortification, as well as facilitate access to high quality micronutrients in the international market. Today, our big need is funding. We're looking for equity partners, investors that can be with us for the long term, as well as partners that can help us finance our working capital needs, specifically to purchase rice from farmers at harvest. Mali has gone through a very, very difficult time over the last few years, but today the picture is a lot brighter. You can listen to the music in Timbuktu and not fear for your life. Our new democratically elected president has made the rice sector a key priority in fighting malnutrition and chronic hunger, key, key, uh, key, key parts of his administration. 
earlier this year, I had the opportunity to meet with President Obama in Senegal, where he inspired us once again, encouraged us to look at African agriculture as the key way to lift millions out of poverty and end malnutrition and chronic hunger in our lifetime. At Mala, we're doing our part, and I invite you to join us to make the world a healthier place, a better place, one fortified rice grain at a time. Thank you. Excellent job. Thank you, Salif. Terrific. And now our final pitcher for this morning is Dr. John R. Seferin, who is Chief Executive Officer of the American Cancer Society. And by the way, the American Cancer Society is celebrating this year its 100th birthday. Thank you very much. It's an important... Uh, it's an important birthday, too, because when our organization got started, any significant diagnosis of cancer anywhere in the world was a virtual death sentence, only to be preceded by a protracted period of pain and suffering. Uh, today, we just published in January, there are 28 million cancer survivors in the world today. Uh, in the United States, two out of three people who get cancer are long-term survivors. The point is think about the things we could achieve if we focus and do the right things. We're trying to do the right things. Um, and that's why I'm proud to be here to represent the largest public-private enterprise to do something about the tobacco problem and smoking in the workplace uh, that's ever been assembled. Uh, imagine for a moment someone you care about, your best friend, an adult child, a neighbor, uh, and imagine that person making decisions every day to take a little exercise, get a decent diet, take care of themselves, certainly avoid tobacco products so that they can have a full and and healthy life, but also so they can be there for their family when they're needed most. Think about that person going to work this morning, only to be surrounded by cigarette smoke throughout the work day. Two billion workers in the world face that situation. Through no fault of their own, they're going to get sick and die early. Remember what we know. Tobacco smoke is a killer. It killed 100 million people in the last century. It's on course, if we don't take action, to kill a billion people this century. And it hurts companies and organizations as well. More lo lost productivity, absenteeism, early disease, excess health care costs, and the like. And I want to remind you of something that happened here two years ago. History making, September 19th and 20th and 2011, the first ever high level meeting of the UN on non communicable diseases. It is said tobacco smoke is one of four major causes of NCDs, non communicable diseases, the major, the number one health, disease, and disability threat of the 21st century. So that's why I'm so proud to be a part of this global smoke free worksite challenge. And it has lots of organizations from the private commercial sector, the not for profit sector, and the governmental sector. Organizations like Johnson and Johnson commercial sector, they're the first of our collaborating partners to go smoke-free worldwide 100%. They have 128,000 employees in 60 countries. They're already seeing improvement in morale, <clears throat> better workforce, and more stable profitability. So uh, we've had success stories in China and Russia and Brazil and a number of other countries. It's an exciting time, and the key point of what I want to say to you today is that we know if we do the right thing, it makes a difference. It's not maybe. It's not a bet or it work half the time. It works all the time. So why am I talking to you about this? I'm not here to ask for money. We, we love for people to invest in it. And we're open to that option. I'm here to ask you because we need your help. We need to clear the air in your organization or your company. And we've got an offer you can't refuse. We've got the best and the brightest. We've got tools. We've got best practices. We've got experience. And we've got expertise. And guess what? It's free. No charge. We'll work with you to say, how can you in your organization and in your culture and in your company get to a smoke-free work environment smoothly and as quickly as possible? It's an exciting time. I'll just simply say to you that we often need to stop, pause, and think, what do we know and what we do not know? We know if we don't intervene. NCDs will take a terrible toll in this world everywhere, not just in the developed world. And the lack of productivity and disability that occur will be an economic disaster. So if you're interested in saving lives and improving the bottom line, you need to talk to us today or during the break or any time during the conference. Thank you for your consideration. Thanks, nice John. Thank you, John. <laughs> Terrific. Please, um, please join me in thanking all our pitch makers this morning. Well done, gang. Terrific job. They've been working very hard to prepare that and to boil all that down into three minutes, which is all they had. So well done, team.
All right, now it's time for some fun. Um, we're actually going to turn the lights on over here so we can see our judges and, well, actually not judges, you're going to be doing a phenomenal job of, uh, of helping to clarify this process. So the next step in what we're going to do here is that the expert panel will be asking a clarifying question of the pitch makers. Here's the deal. The pitch makers have not heard these questions before, so they're going to be nicely on the spot. Um, and after the pitch makers had a few seconds, about 45 seconds to respond, uh, then we'll ask our panelists, the appropriate panelists, to provide about a minute's worth of feedback, some highlights from what they've heard, some ways in which they think the people in this room could partner to mobilize for impact, given that's the theme of the entire event. How do we actually take these terrific presentations and turn them into something which is really going to happen in the real world? Okay, look. So I'm going to invite back up on stage the first of our pitch makers, um, Olivier Berin, who again is the Chief Executive Officer of Man and Nature, and he is going to be uh, interviewed by James Mwangi, who is the Global Managing Partner of Dalberg Global Development Advisors. James. Thank you. Uh, Olivier, thank you for your presentation and for the incredible work that Man and Nature is doing. You talked eloquently about the impact that your work can have on communities uh, in terms of deriving value from the biodiversity around them uh, and, and, and how that works. And I think the supply side of this, of farmers earning a livelihood from the biodiversity was very clear. Uh, you also talked about a few companies that you're partnering with. It was not necessarily as clear uh, to me, or I would love to hear more about what the value proposition of man and nature is to those companies. Why do business with you and with the farmers you're working with at the small scale, at the grassroots, rather than using more traditional uh, value chains for the business that they're doing? Right. We we involve comp the companies we involve uh, include very famous company. We have Chanel, you know, which is famously known, and smaller companies. And when I talk to them, you know, I, I don't say I love animals. You know, I'm a biologist from training. But we're talking about keeping the capital of your company, of the future of the ingredients you are going to look for. Will it be drugs or cosmetic? So that's what we're saying to them. And then fair trade is not enough. You know, if you, if you pay the right price for a product, it's not enough. Coffee is worth nothing in Africa. When you pay 20% more than nothing, it's still not much. So we need to, to have an investment of these companies on the field, and that's what we do to them, have them to follow up the project. And I tell you, you know, you see their staff is motivated through all this. So these companies find a return, which is keeping the potential of developing new product and also the motivation of their staff, you know. But they need to invest. You know, some company, it's not possible anymore that you don't know where the products you're using are coming from. And when you go on the field, you see uh, w how it's done, and you see the local communities, and then you make the link, and then everybody's happy, you know, to get involved. Thank you. Um, I, I think overall, I, I, you know, I think you're on to something in the sense of the market for the future, and I think it, it, it's an exciting space. Um, I think in particular the idea that you're engaging with these companies around the, the feedstock of products of the future and getting them to preserve biodiversity that will create profits in the future is, is compelling. Um, I think, at least from my observation, a little bit more around the, the, the hook with the companies, particularly in terms of the path to scale, in terms of their supply, and, I, and I'm sure that's something that, that we can also talk a little bit about. You talked about mostly small producers. I would imagine a big challenge here is if you're dealing with big companies showing that you can actually, should they, you know, as they scale up, really scale up with them. Uh, and thinking through that and thinking through how you really formalize and, 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 and structure in that way would be useful. Um, and I think going beyond, uh, you know, the, the new products and the, and the staff motivation are fantastic points. What we've seen in some of our work is uh, the need to show real financial benefit in the long term and how is it that you are able to, to show in, you know, better cost dynamics and so on as you get to scale um, by working better with communities and once you factor all in all, in all the other hidden costs. So that's the one observation I would offer, um, but I think it makes sense and I'm keen to see how it evolves uh, as, a, as a business and as a social enterprise. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, James, very much. Um, so, Olivier, good job. Uh, if you Thank will you. go and join Olivier at the back of the room later on, if you have uh, more questions for him or ideas, please do. So, Pala Vigaikwad, I'm going to invite you back onto the stage right now. Uh, this is your chance. Uh, we're going to ask Linda Rottenberg, who is, as you know, the CEO of Endeavor Global, to ask you a question. So you did a fantastic job. I loved it. I was glad we only had three minutes because I didn't want you taking off anything more, but I loved it. <laughs> so you had fantastic energy. Your story, the story of the girl you told, moved us. We want to join the game. So my question for you is really simply, all of us who are moved, walk us through how an individual can really get involved and, and become your partner. We want two things from the this thing. First, we want partners to implement our program on your region, on your place, on your country. And second, we want resource from you. Great. And just a follow-up, so if to, you said you were setting up a kind of franchise or training system, if someone wants to take your program and implement it in their country, do you have a kind of step-by-step -step for how they, can, how they can do that if they come over and talk to you? Yes, of course. We have, uh, first we have curriculum to uh, this program. We have a go goal module, we call them. And yes, we have trainings, we have steps to how this program will go. So we have this all thing. Great. I think you're doing a fantastic job. Thank you. Um, I, I think the only th two things I'll say is that when I was in college, we had a program for women leaders from all different disciplines to come and talk to us. And at every one of these sessions that lasted throughout the year, one of the questions was to what do they attribute their success? And they were in all different realms. And the most surprising thing is there was one common answer. And the one common answer was they played a team sport. And I think if you take what that symbolized to me and what we heard this morning on the plenary panel about the importance of power empowering girls and how this will solve a whole host of problems, I think it just shows all of us why we really need to go over to your table and, and support you however we can. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Pallavi, Good very day. much. Good job. Okay, thank you. So Farah, will you come back up on stage, Farah Mohammed, who is uh, from the Girls 20 Summit. Um, it's your turn, Chuck Slaughter, founder and president of Living Goods, to uh, ask Farah your question. Hi, Farah. You did an absolutely terrific presentation. Um, uh, people are in this room and have come to this convenient because they want to make a difference. Um, and they're willing to invest their time, their energy, their organizations um, in that. Um, I, I wanna, I'd like to, you to give them, if, if you can, as clear as possible picture of what success looks like. So if they invest their time and energy with you, what success do you hope to deliver, say, in, in, in five years? And be as specific as you can. Maybe off the field, I'd say yeah. uh, success looks like this. Success looks like this young woman <coughs> who has the confidence and all the other skills that she's going to learn. Success for us means that our girls will follow their passions. Success for us means a grander scale of numbers. So right now we do 21 girls a year. They go back to their communities and they empower at least 100 girls in each of their programs. Our hope is that they will empower other girls. So for me, it's the domino effect. The other thing I think that looks like success is 10 years from now, we've got a whole new ring of influencers who are gonna go and be the Christian Lagards. They're gonna go and be presidents, prime ministers, CEOs. They're gonna start their own social profits. They're gonna start their own for profits. And we don't wanna limit them by what it is that they think they've only just learnt. We want to bring them to the summit and expose them to ideas. I'm going to add one thing. We do this in partnership with more than 50 different organizations. And those are social profit organizations and organizations like Google and Caterpillar and Norton Rose Fulbright because we can't do it without their content. Because the girls have got to learn what are the different skills they need to actually lead in their own communities. Uh, so I think this is really powerful. Um, and I, I had the same first reaction you did, is I think the, the first action I would take is bring, in, bring Pallavi to your next summit. I said, how old are you? <laughs> <laughs> that was what I was, and if I you was can, off there, I was like, how old are you? You can come up with a cloning strategy, that wouldn't hurt either. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting, many of us are involved with organizations like yours and like CGI, who's, who starts with a focal point around an event, right. uh, an annual convening. And I think a cha there's, a, there's an enormous opportunity, how do you take the uh, momentum and the energy and the resources in the room at an event and turn it into a sustaining, year-round, enduring um, uh, effort. So 
we, we haven't had a chance to get into the detail, but I would encourage you to think about how do you build support around the year for these young women um, uh, to help them succeed. That's one, one thought. And another is, um, and this is tricky, I think you're investing, the power of this is you're investing in great, in, in exceptional individuals. Um, but it's a big world with a lot of problems, and you might think about the question of whether you, whether you want to focus in some way, each, it's, whether it's a thematic focus each year or a geographic focus that, that enables you to bring um, more specific attention to an area and, and, uh, and draw out expertise. Um, uh, and then last but not least, you know, you're in an area which has, uh, where there are people who have tried before, um, um, uh, where mentoring and, and um, uh, social entrepreneurs, um, uh, people have had a lot of success. Um, Linda to my right, organizations like Ashoka, I think there's a lot to learn from those, those uh, prior successes. Can I just say one thing? Yeah. We consider ourselves stalkers. We basically go and we do what the G20 leaders do. We take all the good information, we partner, and we tackle really tough issues. And we do it in a kind of way that's very creative. So a lot of that stuff that you pointed out, we're a year-long program, so I think we'll drop the summit and just call us the, the Girls 20. Thank you. Terrific. Well stalked. Very good. Thank you, Farah. Okay, Salif, will you come back up on stage? And uh, James, back to you. Salif, you, you talked about nutrition, fortification of food in, in West Africa. I'm from the East, but it taps into uh, the clear need to rethink agriculture and how Africa feeds itself and indeed hopefully can feed the world. Um, you also laid out a business that's already up and running um, and which is seeking investment. Um, a part of that uh, is, is, is giving a sense of where uh, potentially you think uh, Malo can go. So I had a specific question, which is, you, you've laid out what you're doing right now in Mali, which is one country. I'd be curious to know, you know, what do you think is a full market potential of this intervention? Is it just for Mali? And is there anything distinctive about what Malo's capabilities are in fortifying rice? It sounds like something that should be happening to uh, starches across Africa. Is there anything distinctive about what you are able to do that will allow you to, to really be part of driving that across the continent? Great, so uh, we're, we're talking a lot about partnerships and mobilizing impact. Uh, the great news is that the technology use we're using to fortify has been developed by PATH and is already in India, it's in Brazil, it's in Kenya now, so it's global. Uh, but what we're doing in Mali is adapting it to our local strengths, uh, looking at the whole value chain. So can we get farmers to actually contribute to the nutritional health of their own families and their, and their neighbors? So it's really a model, trying to get like a whole value chain model uh, up and running. But one concrete example, or how we can expand beyond, uh, beyond uh, Mali is right next door to Senegal, uh, where uh, this summer I met um, uh, an owner of a, of a, a company that produces uh, porridge uh, for school children uh, using millet. So they said, why don't we try making porridge with fortified rice? And then so the kids can eat something other than uh, millet-based porridge every, every morning. So that's one way to scale, is different products that are adapted to different, uh, different uh, groups. Um, the other way we can also expand is, if we have the capacity to produce the, the fortificant, the ultra rice grains in Mali at scale, we have seven neighbors. You know, we have seven neighboring, seven neighboring countries. Uh, by March 2014, we'll have the capacity to produce enough grains to fortify 100,000 tons. So we can export just the grains to local millers in Ivory Coast, in Burkina Faso, so they can blend those with the local rice that they, their own farmers produce. So we have m many different scaling strategies. It's, it's not only to go and build large facilities all over Africa, that's, that's vital, we have to do that. Um, but there's other ways as well we can have an impact on, on, on bringing fortified rice and making it uh, much more ubiquitous. Thank you for that, and, 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 and again, thank you for what you're doing. I think what I found most exciting about the approach you're taking is is the degree to which you're bringing a business discipline to tackling this opportunity, but at the same time really engaging social actors, so PATH, GAIN, and others. And uh, you know, what I would urge is, is to continue thinking in that blended way. And, 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 and you know, there's so many opportunities, particularly in underdeveloped parts of the world, uh, you know, many African countries and elsewhere, where taking a pure business or pure social sector view will be a dead end but bringing skills, capabilities, and so on that have been developed primarily by social entrepreneurs 
and then bringing a little bit of a business discipline, particularly around executing. And I think that's going to be the big thing. Is we need a lot of help on that. It's a fantastic yeah. story, and it's a it's 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 a, it's a f you know fantastic concept and a great market opportunity. The next step in this is get the bags of rice out fortified uh, to the people. So um, yeah, very exciting, and and all the best. This is crucial work. Thank you, Sully, very much. Okie doke. Um, so we're finally on to John Seffern again. John, let me give you your microphone. And uh, Chuck, over to you. Uh, hi, John. This, uh, the, 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 the topic that you are addressing, of course, is vital. And I, I, if I understand correctly, this afternoon, the plenary this afternoon, Presidents Obama and, and Clinton will be asking some um, serious questions around uh, noncommunicable diseases. Um, the 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 idea of making workplaces smoke-free is so compelling and so obvious, and the benefits are so manifest. My, my main question is, what is stopping companies from getting on board? I, I think it's very simple that it's when we get around to it, and they have all these priorities about the bottom line, and that's why we want to make the economic case that this is good for the bottom line, and you can count on that. But I think part of, and then part of it is, I've talked to a number of people. It's it's one thing in the in the C-suites and and in the uh, white collar. Uh, companies, but when you get to blue collar and workers, then they say there are some really practical reasons that that's going to be difficult for us to do. There are ways to get around it, but it takes a, a little planning, and that's why I made the comment that we have tools and best practices and expertise, and we can hook you up with other people who face similar problems and work through those and hopefully get over the hump. Our feeling is is that yes, we need to change public policy also. But it's ideal if people can be empowered to change their own culture and help establish uh, non-tobacco-free uh, uh, workplaces and communities as, as the norm. Yeah, I, you know, this, this is a very big topic. It affects all of us, um, every taxpayer, every employee, everyone who shares a room with someone who holds a cigarette. Um, uh, the two things that, that I thought when I, when, I heard, when I heard this idea that, that uh, were compelling me, one is, 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 is how, do you how do you get people over the hump on this? And I remember seeing a, uh, an ad campaign trying to convince, uh, persuade young people to stop smoking. And I think what was learned in this campaign is if you go at them with the health benefit, it's very hard. Yes. Um, because smoking is attractive for all sorts of reasons, have nothing to do with maintaining your health. And so they went after a very a different, a very different approach was they learned that, uh, you know, or that, you know, was became clear that smoking causes uh, impotence. Yeah. And, and that caught the attention of some young people. <laughs> and so maybe it's not always the direct approach that wins the day in this category. Um, uh, but the other thing that's compelling here, I think, is the workplaces are important. Um, but really, why shouldn't this be public policy that smoking is prohibited wherever people work? And um, as, as you and I discussed earlier, I think it's very compelling the idea of can you use um, visionary leading companies in the world to be the forefront, to be the thought leaders that bring the legislators along that makes this absolutely public policy and not just the choice of individual companies. Well, it's, it's a very good point. Let me just say, in addition to the impotency, it accelerates the aging process. So you see serious diseases about 10 years earlier in smokers uh, of all kinds than, than you do. Uh, there's no question but what part of solving the cancer problem and the tobacco problem is uh, a major piece of that is changed public policy. And the best example, I think, Chuck, that I can give of that is that anywhere in the world that's been tried, if you increase state or federal excise taxes on tobacco, you get a drop in prevalence rates in both adults and children, and children in particular are most sensitive to that. So when you have a tool that works, it's efficacious, not half the time, but all the time, then it becomes a moral imperative for you to change public policy. And I, I'll just make the comment, uh, what keeps me awake at night is uh, most of the suffering from cancer and most of the deaths from cancer today in the United States, that's 1,500 people today, are dying needlessly. When our organization got started, even when I got involved as a volunteer 40 years ago, you couldn't say that, but you can say it today. So it's an in, in my opinion, it's a moral imperative that we take action. Uh, we are now saving in America 400 more lives from cancer per day than we were in 1991 when the cancer deaths started to go down. But I went to my board and said, but look, here's the evidence, it could be 1,000 a day but we have to change our platform to get that done, and we're changing our platform to do that, and that's why we're a part of this collaborative uh, global smoke-free worksite challenge. Thank you, John, very much. Thank you. Good job. All righty, um, so many thanks to our expert panel. Uh, of course, now the moment comes where it's your turn, and the key to this morning's session 
is not that you sit in your chairs and you listen to the presentations and you say congratulations to them and congratulations to them for such terrific questions. It's that you now engage, please. There are two or three particular ways that you can engage. Of course, going along, giving your ideas and talking and dialoguing and suggesting potential partners and giving them ideas and giving them feedback um, is an important way. Uh, you can, through the mobile app, the CGI mobile app, suggest potential partners. And we have some convenient goldfish bowls, I hope. Is that right? Do we have some goldfish bowls? Uh, yes, we do. They are. Uh, Yes, they are intentionally devoid of goldfish this morning for your cards to go in there. And if you can scribble a note on the back of any card saying if you have any ideas for these people, so much the better. So over to you. Many, many thanks for participating. Again, there's another session at 10.30 on Thursday morning if you can join us. Thank you all.